Hi there, my name's Harry and I am the host for Phaseo Connects. And in this interview, we're going to be speaking with Andrew Alshorn, who has insisted that I cannot introduce him as an expert. So instead, I'm going to speak a little bit about who Andrew is and his qualifications so that you can make an assessment. Um, Andrew has been working in AM for a long time. He first started back in 1994 working for 3D Systems as an application engineer. He was formerly the vice president of AMUG, the Additive Manufacturing Users Group uh, in the United States, and um, has since 2007 been running his own additive manufacturing businesses, including 3D Squared, which provides consultancy and, and advisory services uh, for 3D printing applications in industry. And who was also involved in setting up Ad 3 d in Cumbria in the United Kingdom, which provides end-to-end -end manufacturing consul uh, consultancy and actual manufacturing services. Um, in this interview, Andrew talks, uh, we talk about a whole bunch of different topics, including certification, how to look for industrial machines and uh, how, to, how to select materials and the kinds of things you can do with materials. And most importantly, Andrew really focuses on the point, which is that a lot of work has been done with an additive over the last 30 years, and we should continue to build on that work and not repeat the, the same experiments again. Instead, we should look back, we should index the old work, we should learn from the old work and build on the shoulders of those people who were, were doing that work before us. So I hope you enjoyed this interview. Thank you. No, not a problem. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. Um, so actually the first thing I wanted to start with was just like what you thought of form next, um, what, what your takeaway was. Yeah. Form next is really good. I've been going there. I said since when I was it, I think it's 1996 when it was called Euromold. Uh, um, but yeah, loved it. Some interesting technologies, metals seems to be, um, a big thing at the moment. There are also a lot of plastics, and I'm liking the big um, extruders, you know, mounted on robot arms, and that's yeah. metals, metals and plastics. I think that's a really cool. Yeah, there was. Um, I saw a Caracol. Did you go by them? Oh, I know. So <laughs> I'm going to name drop now. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a guy called Tim Lyons. He works with those guys. So I've known Tim years. So he's one of the guys I actually met. Uh, at the event, uh, yeah, really good. It's been that's been I saw it at Rapid, uh, and because I know Tim, then I know quite a bit about that technology, and it's yeah, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. I was chatting. Um, so I was so I went to Advanced Engineering UK um, as well, and I was looking at some of the work that people were doing with composites, which I thought was really cool with um, uh, with the larger machines. They're basically um, printing a solvent, a soluble material. And then they were putting their their composite around the outside of it, and then they'd put it all into water, and they could use it to make F one parts. Yeah, that's been happening for years. There so you basically, go. Yeah, so basically, what they used to do, you know, the the bigger machines now. So originally, yeah, the the, the, the tr traditional FDM machines they used to use the support structure to do exactly the same. So they build the the farmer from the support structure, which is water soluble, put the carbon fiber over the top of it. Yeah, and that's they view. Yeah, it's basically making what they call a mandrel, mm. uh, and then it's you get rid of it when it's finished. So that's something they've been doing for quite a while. But um, yeah, as new technology comes along, there's different ways of doing it, and, uh, uh, and it makes you think. Well, it makes me think. Okay, how can I use that? And then I just go off and run with it, and then you'll yeah. sort of have it in the back of your mind. You'll see something else that. Um, you could use your phone, you, yeah. Then it's a case of let's have a go. It's finding the right people that want to let let's have a go as well. That's part of the battle. So, what what new stuff at Form Next you were seeing? You said you saw something on metals as well, right? Yeah, a lot of it's uh, the metal side of things. Um, the the ones that interest me are the ones that I've never seen before. Oh, I think hey, that's interesting. I can use that for different applications. So there was one company from. Um, New Zealand, I should dig their name out really, but basically they make a, so they 3D print um, the tool, uh, so instead of pr printing a master pattern or uh, to make a wax pattern, these guys are 3D printing the tool and then there's a system where they print the tool and then they put it into the next piece of equipment, drop an ingot of metal on the top, like a microwave and it basically just melts and then fills the tool, metal path. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Um, I should. So they were they were microwaving they were microwaving metal. 
Yeah, that's something again. You know, yeah. I said so when I, you know at my age when a microwave came out, somebody said, "Don't put metal in a microwave." <laughs> yeah, because in the end you're gonna have sparks. You're gonna set the thing on fire. It could blow up. Uh, so for me, seeing that sort of thing, and again, it's just understanding how technology changes. There's a thing that they do at uh, the at AMUG, and it's called casting in a box. Now, for years, I've gone to that, you know, AMUG and as a VP and uh, running the tracks. You never get to get in, to do anything, and that's a hands-on experience. So I think the, it was, uh, when was it, 20, 21? I actually got time to actually go and do it because they moved it to the end of the week. And for me, it was cool. I'm thinking, okay, metal in a microwave. Yeah, and I know the guy that does it, and I, and, I, and it's a, it's a special metal. Well, it's a soft, a low melting point. I like old bismuth, and they melt it in the in the microwave, and it was like didn't spark. Um, don't know if it's, it was a standard microwave. Melted it, and then we poured it into a three D printed mold. So again, that's what this new machine does, but it's all self contained. Huh. So That's with really the one cool. we, with the one when we did it with the sort of casting in a box, it was a case of somebody printed the molds for us. Uh, then we put them on a the desk, got the metal in a little you know melting pot, poured it in by hand. This thing all does it self-contained, so it's um, it's pretty interesting. And it, you know, I saw it. At, it was funny because I saw it as the it was the last thing that I saw at Rapid in the states. And I sat down and had a chat with them there. And then it was the first machine when I came into Farm Next that I saw. And I'm like, okay, that's a bit strange. But got to sit with the same lady, uh, met the boss of the company. Uh, potentials really, you know, it's really interesting. And also you can actually, you can do fairly big parts. Um, so I think the biggest casting that they did from it was, I would probably say about 250 cube. 250 um, cubed. Yeah, yeah and, it, and it was really intricate as well. It was like a lattice work. So, jeez. Um, yeah, because that's you know that's that that's one that's interesting. Um, you know, I don't. I see all the latest technologies and new machines, faster machines. Um, you know, still printing with resins, the same resins, just a faster machine. Those things I don't. I I do understand, but. Um, it, again, it's not a technology change. It's just making something quicker. Um, and to me, that's not really pushing our industry forward. Hmm. Doing different things is what's pushing us forward. And it's not its not the machines that actually push, it's push the materials forward. It, it is the process and also the materials. You know, if you're talking about standard printers like resin printers, it's actually people coming along with new resins that, haven't been out before. Like making, there's people working on conductive resin, filled materials. Um, you know, these technologies are, are fantastic technologies, yeah, but they are a tool, mm. yeah. And then once people realise that it's a tool, yeah, and you can use it in conjunction with other tools, so you can use CNC, you can use handwork, you can traditional craftsmanship. And you combine them to get the best solution for the application you're working on, then this industry would fly because people would start to do things and think in a different way about how they use the technology, not just using 3D printing for the sake of using it. Yeah. I'll give an example. So what, about 28 years ago, I went to a company that made uh, water pumps. And we were looking at making an inject. We were making a resin tool so they could um, basically cast waxes into it. And there was a sliding insert. And the insert was just the shape of a wedge. So the two halves of the tool were pretty complex. Yeah. The wedge was really simple. So the guy automatically says, so you need the three STL files. And I'm like, well, how long will it take you to make the other one if you machine it? And he said, 10 minutes. I said, well, machine it then. And he went, oh, you can actually do that. And I'm like, yeah. And that's the bit that we need to get over to people. And I think, I suppose my background, um, you know, I studied art and design, ended up at a model makers. And then I learned lots of um, pattern makers. Mm -hmm. And they would, they would use what they needed to use to get the job done. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where it comes from. It's actually looking and saying, well, why would you print that? Because that's like, 
It's, it's interesting. Do, do you get the same level of specialization in like injection molding you think as you get in additive? Or do you think because additive is so exciting, it draws people like just into additive? Yeah. At the moment, I think it is. It's it's a case of, it's what, it's like, I'm, I'm say, got to use the right words. I'm a bit older. So it's like the in thing or the funky thing to do, you know? Um, mm, yeah. It, oh, I, yeah. But that's what I thought 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, man, this, so I saw it, I first saw it working and somebody told me about it and then I first saw it working and I was like, wow, I need to know how that works. Crazy though, that that, that hype is still, is still here in think, a way. Yeah, I, I think it's a different type of hype now. Um, the hype, the hype for me was, it was a buzz just to see the thing working. I actually, you know, because I've done the hands on myself. Hmm. This particular component, it was this machine was building. It was an SLA 25040. Um, and it was building a, a fiber optics junction box for a telecommunications company. It's only about five or six mil deep. But when you looked inside it, it was really complex because it was guiding the, the fiber optics round. Now, I actually, just, because of my experience in the model makers and making things by hand, I, used, I, lo I just looked at it and I thought, that would probably take me a week. Yeah, if I could make it, because some yeah. of the parts were really intricate. This thing did it in four hours, and I was like, okay, for you guys now. So it's, what were it's you doing in the model makers? You were carving or like something like that? Yeah, well, no, you you just, you could bend, you know, you could bend plastics. So it was all traditional stuff. The pat, there were the guys that worked there, a lot of older guys were pattern makers. So I was one, basically, I was a designer. Hmm. You know, I studied art and design, went to art college, uh, and there, what? Whenever I design something, I have to make a model. So I have to show people what I designed and what it would do. Uh, so I ended up working in the model makers. And, but as a designer, so I was designing exhibitions, training aids for fighter pilots. So it was pretty interesting. Oh, but wow. then because, because they knew I could actually um, produce models by hand, if there was a guy down or, he was, or they were short of a model maker, and the other thing was spraying. I, I used to, I used to be pretty good at spraying the models I made. So if the if the paint the painter was off, then it was like I'd two days or a week while he's off doing all the yeah. finishing and make, making things look real. Uh, but that was the only way that you could do it then, because there were no three D printers. Mm, okay. All right. So we'd we'd use sheet materials, solid materials. You can again combining all the different technologies or different hand ways of doing it, CNC machining to get the finished product. Um, so that's probably why I see, I've always seen 3D printing. It's really interesting and you can do complex shapes with it. But when I, when you start doing more advanced applications with it, then it's just a, another tool that I can put into the armory that I've got. And I use, I pick like, I'll have that tool for this, I'll have that tool for that. You put them together to get the best result. Yeah. Well, I, do you think, you know, I've been thinking a lot about certification recently and, and certification in a 3D printing context. And, you know, one of the things that I think I'd be interested for your thoughts on this. One of the things that I thought was kind of um, uh, it's the the great sort of elephant in the room with 3D printing is that you it, it's also the great thing about 3D printing. It's you don't need a tool. Um, you don't need to have that upfront cost and every every part you print can be different, right? Um, yep. And at the same time, that's also what means you can't certify it. Because if every part's different, then that means that you need to, and certification is based on reproducibility. Um, yep. uh, yeah. I don't know, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, it's something that's been needed for a long time. You know, um, I was lucky because a lot of the people that I work with, like the F1 industries, it's a case of it lasts like an hour and a half. And if it falls apart on a finish line, You've done, it's done its job. Mm, if it actually yeah. doesn't fall apart as soon as it crosses his line, it means it's over-engineered, right? Because <laughs> they, they could less want, material. Yeah, so it, so it's a, it's in that and in that side of things, they they don't have to get things certified because it they do for the safety side of things. They do all the testing for materials, but they can they can take a little bit more risk with the sorts of things because that's the the game they're in. And and you know, with um, if you swap over to say traditional auto uh, auto manufacturers like so, it's mass produced cars, different ball game altogether. Mm -hmm. That's yes. when you need to get the certification done. And 
up until recently, uh, they did it all in house themselves. And it's interesting, interesting that you mentioned this because I found out by testing materials for, uh, well, it was a Le Mans racing team. They found a material that was it cured a 355 nanometer, so it would run in an SLA machine, but it had never been in an SLA machine, right? Apart from uh, in Japan, where it came from. Mm. Now, because the race team was a Japanese race team, they were allowed to get it, but it had never been run in a machine. And, you know, that, that side of it, um, I had to basically create all the parameters, uh, build tensile bars, do testing, uh, which I'd never done before. And so I'd never done it before, got in touch with someone I know in the industry, in the resin industry. And I said, look, you have the procedures for making this tensile bar. How, to, how do we test tensile bars? Um, so I've got this just standard thing. It's been around for years. But what you've got to remember, this was written a long time ago when there was no 3D printing. So it was done for injection molded parts, metal parts, mm. and you're pulling these things apart. And if you, re if you read the sort of documentation and you did it correctly, you basically were supposed to build the, um, the dog bones or the tensile bars that you snap, yeah. and then you leave them for a week. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, and then you test them. All right, because all the stress is that going to material when you're machining stuff, because it was, again, it was all done for metals and injection molding stuff. Uh, and it was basically to give it all time to, to work properly. So to let with, the like crystal structure relax, right? Yep. Yeah. But it's, but it's the same for um, resins. Ah, I didn't know that. Okay. Right. What? Well, so basically, this, so I'm going through this process. And then because I've been in the industry a long time, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking to myself, okay, that's really interesting. So at one of the AMOGs, this is a while ago, that it was when there was uh, three resin manufacturers. So you had 3D Systems, DSM, and I'm trying to think of the other one. Swiss, no, it was a Swiss company. Oh. Um, well, it'll come back to me. But, um, so it was really cool doing it. And, but I, you know, most normal companies don't have the equipment to do the tensile yes. bar test, but a, a Le Mans racing team does, right? Yes. So I'm trying to get more strength out of this material than they were using from an existing material. And we did it. It was like unbelievable. It was like a third, a third stiffer and, and than the, the material they had in their own machines. But then when I went to this um, AMUG, where we were, they had the, the sort of materials panel there. You could ask me ask questions, and I said, "Right, I've got a question for you." I said, "When you do the, when you produce these parts, you create the the tensile bar testings." I said, "And what I found is you've got to wait seven days before you do the testing." And they said, "Yeah, that's correct." And I said, "Right, so the data on your data sheet for those materials, yeah." is valid after the parts being sat around for seven days. The majority of prototype parts that came off a machine were in the customer's hands within three days, three days and being tested. Yeah. Right? Which means yeah. that those, those parts they were testing didn't have the same properties as what was on the data sheet. <laughs> So what what's the is there is like a is there like a process that this is like that this is documented is is it an ISO standard yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's it's a, it's a standard uh -huh. right but but and I have to because I brought this conversation up and then you got a room full of people in our industry it was when Abel was a lot smaller and they didn't understand and I said well basically you're producing parts getting them out the door giving them to customers but the materials not at that. It's not if you actually did a tensile bar test after three days, it would it wouldn't be what's on the data sheet. Yeah, you almost need to like you'd almost need to like do a tensile test immediately afterwards, two day, and then one each day, and then Correct. see how the tensile stress changes throughout yeah. that time. And then right? and then what you do is you need so basically there should be a gra the way to do it. I actually said to them, I said I understand that you have to do this because this is the the standard that's out there. And I actually said, they said, how do you think we should solve it? I said, go and write our own procedures because those procedures were written before our industry was there, basically. Yeah. So, 
it's it's, it's interesting. I, I, was, I, was, I was I was on Reddit the other day, and I and I and I saw um this poster. Apparently, there's some old English law that it's illegal to be drunk in public in the UK. And I cracked up. <laughs> that, that, I'll have to send. You, I'll send you some. So there's quite a few in. Um... It, as I said, I'm originally from Wales, and it, yeah, there's some in the local towns like so Chester. You're from the, you've been, you know, so you, so you know of Chester. Chester, of course. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's there's all sorts of rules about you can, you know, if certain people from Wales can drive their flock of sheep to the city centre, blah blah blah. But you've got to have it. So yeah, there's some there's some really strange things like that in the do in you, the UK. Do you think the do you think though the certification thing is the same thing? Like, do you think the, the certification process is simply not adapted, or do you actually think that there's there's like that there's that certification process which they are using is simply not the right process, and there is a new standard needed? I, I think we have to create our own. I think um, the standards. I think this, we should use the standards that are there as a guideline, so that we follow the the standards that people have written before. But then we need to do it specifically for this industry. Um, mm -hmm. It's just because the the technology is new, you know. It's not. I, asked, I said after thirty years, I actually thought we'd be where we are now after ten years. But that's just my personal side of it, and and it is really good. You know, my concern with going to as a vice president of AMUG, you used to have to get all the um, the vendors there, mm -hmm. and it was always people that make parts, materials, blah blah. And then all of a sudden, I'd say back in about two thousand eighteen two or three people came that were writing standards, which to me is like I said, we've needed this for years. Yeah. My biggest concern is when you get like four, I think there's probably about six or seven different companies now. Now, personally, I'm like, we're going down a, a strange road there because how do you decide, if there's eight people do it, how do you decide which is the right one or which is the one we use? Yeah. Well, I suppose part of the question is like, what are they also certifying, right? Are they certifying the process or are they certifying the, the quality of the um, additive parts? I think that, that I th well, again, it depends. You talk to different people. Some people are certifying uh, the parts. Some people are certifying the materials. And maybe I think the way, personally, the way to do it would be to get them all together. And create a, like a, I don't know, it needs to be done. I suppose ASTM, ASTM are one of the sort of major people. Um, and it's just making sure that it's it's all done where we all work together, share the knowledge, and maybe create, use everybody's data to create one um, one database, that which is, that becomes the way that we, we sort of standardize additive manufacturing parts and the processes. Yeah, um, you know it's interesting how <clears throat> it's like it's interesting how you, people are trying to say they're making standard parts on on machines. Um, you know, you can I've had two machines sat next to each other, exactly the same machines, same laser, same material. One will build slightly faster than the other one. Same parameters, everything. And I, I, I it's interesting for me how how do you standardize that? Yeah. If if one part's taking an hour, it's the same part and it's taking an hour longer on the other machine, and a lot of it was to do with the laser beam shape. Yeah, yeah. So you ha so basically, you know that the machine is going to work. But if you get one which has got a slightly sharper point than um, the next machine, yeah, or a higher peak sum ratio, it means that it can cure the resin to the parameter that you've specified a little bit faster. Ah. Okay. Yeah, but then if yeah. it's doing it a little bit faster, yes. is the part that comes off going to be the same as the one that's a little bit slower? So it's it's so hard to do. Yeah, you know, if yeah. you have a power, if you have a power spike, say your machine's halfway through a build and then all of a sudden, whoop, there's a power spike. What the heck happens to your laser? You know, I still find it amazing that there's a lot of industry out there that don't he they don't even run their machines on a UPS. Yes. I had I, I had a, a chat with someone years ago who said that um, they were having inconsistency. I don't remember what kind of machine it was. It would have been a maybe it was Arkham or something like that. Yeah. Um, but they said that they were connected to the mains line, and um, when people came, uh, I think it was, if I recall correctly, they had a hip machine there as well. And when they would switch on the hip the hip machine, it would spike. The the, the current would drop in the uh, in the building. 
and that yep. would cause the like interference on the uh, and the, with the print process, which you could actually apparently, which you could even detect using uh, in-process sensors, which is pretty. Yeah, great. It's, it's like, yeah, yeah. Well, it is. Well, if you I said similar thing, if you look at an F one team, hmm. if they turn on the uh, the wind tunnel, that's like switching everybody in a, a pretty big town turning the lights on at the same time. The power <laughs> to like kick it off. You know, and how does that affect the processes? You know, I'll, I'm not going to name it. So I was asked to look at a couple of machines um, that were based in Asia, right? And I looked at the, there was something wrong with the mirror tuning. So this is on, a, again, it's on an SLA machine. And again, I have this set of parameters that I work to, and these mirrors should give you a, a gauge, like a curve that you can follow. And... I looked at one of the machines, and this curve wasn't a curve. It looked like a an ant had run around the page for a bit. You know, it was all over the place. And then I looked at the next machine, and it was exactly the same. Just a random walk. Yeah, and I'm like, what the heck's going on? So first thing is I'm thinking of, like you said there, is there electrical interference? You know, so I'm asking this customer, is there any electrical cables run across the top of the machine, near the machine? Blah, blah. No, nothing at all. So I couldn't work it out. So I ended up going and I walked into the room and basically they they had a UPS, which consisted of 20 to 30 car batteries that were jumping next to each other, sat in the same room as two 3D printers. That's insane. Right? And it, yeah, the thing is, it, only, it basically it only threw the graphics off. <sighs> So the machines were building fantastic parts, but for me as a service engineer working remotely, it was like, what the heck's going on? I'm I'm sure those machines must have cost millions, though, right? Like, surely you need to invest a bit yeah, more. That's, yeah, that's, to be honest, that's the fine thing I find funny. Um, I don't well, I don't understand it to be honest. You know, I've got I I've got a couple of I've got the original machine I worked on, and I've got a Viper, and I have a UPS. The UPS gives me. Uh, four four hundred pounds. It will run for an hour, and it will run both machines for an hour. Um, and I go into companies that don't have any. And if you have a really bad power surge, you can blow a board up in your machine, and the board costs more than what the UPS would cost you. Yeah, of course. So I so I really struggle to understand with people that. <laughs> I, there's a couple of things I wanted to pick your brain about because I was thinking about this when I went into Formnext, right? I was like, you know, I'm going to go and like speak to a bunch of manufacturers, but the manufacturers are going to look at machines and to look at materials, right? Yep. So would you, what, I mean, how, can you give me some insight into like how, how a manufacturer goes into that and how, and how a manufacturer would assess, especially a, a manufacturer who's just getting started might assess like what kinds of machines should I look for? What sorts of materials should I look for? Actually, there's been an interesting conversation on LinkedIn about this recently. Mm. You know, the, the car manufacturers years ago were the first people to actually take this on board. So people like Ford, um, you know, Chrysler, uh, aerospace industries have been involved in it for quite a while, Boeing um, and then Airbus now. Uh, and then it went over, I think after about two or three years, that's when I got it into Formula One. And then that really helped push it. Um, but I think people, especially now, um, people need to talk to um, well, people like myself, people like Phil Dickens, uh, all the guys that have been in it for a long time. You know, even the guys that run the machines and they've been running them for a long time. They need to speak to those people about what to look for when they use the machine. And it's really interesting. That there's, so most companies, they, they'll actually look at a product they've got to make and they'll just say, right, we need to make this as a prototype. And then what they need to look at is, do they actually want it, not just a prototype, but do they want it to work properly? You know, and they tend to look at different technologies. Well, we make it out of plastic, but you know, but in in some cases, it might be better than buying a metal part and making a tool, a quick tool. So, and I, the best people. So, one of the best people I've worked with in the industry is a guy called Gerard Wynn Stanley, 
and he's left the industry now. He's not involved anymore. But he used to look at what materials they used traditionally to make the thing. So the machine didn't even come into the first decisions. Mm. It was like, right, how do we make this at the moment? And this is it's very at. use case dependent then, basically. Yeah, and he basically used to say, right, this is what we we want a material that will do this, do this, do this. Right, they find the material, right, and then they go, which machines use that material or which machines have the capability of using that material? And that's how they decided where they were going to go and look for machines. Mm. Whereas a lot of people, they'll, they'll actually look and say, I just want to get involved in 3D printing, end up buying the wrong thing. Yeah, well, I do, I guess as well, like the, uh, you also have the benefit that nowadays, uh, which is that you have a lot of service bureaus now where you could probably do a design and say, hey, I'm thinking about maybe getting this thing made in Inconel and then send it to a manufacturer that does Inconel and yeah. they can send it back. You can get your design right. You can ask them about their machine. So on, so yeah, it, 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 it is a lot more around now. Um, I think, you know, I did one job for a big, a massive, uh, international sort of electrical company and they didn't want to talk to them they did, actually didn't want to talk to the machine manufacturers really yeah because um again you know every machine can be used to do everybody's prototype and they didn't want the constant phone calls from sales guys trying to sell them stuff they didn't want all the hype yeah so they basically Paid, paid me to take all the flack and the phone calls off people, which is interesting. But it wasn't that, it, it was a, it was a, when I look back at what, at what they did and why they did it, it was really interesting because it wasn't just about buying the right machine. It was about working with the right company. Mm. You know, they wanted to know uh, if I bought this, how long did the part take? Which orientation is the best orientation? How many could I get on a platform? Uh, if I buy a machine off a bureau, what's it going to cost me? If I have a machine in house, what's it going to cost me? And they were interested in all of it, and they wanted all of the information. And I realized it was they they realized that they're going to have to work with these people for a long time. So it wasn't just about buying the machine; it was buying a machine and the sort of customer support that came with it. Yeah. So, uh, so you would say then that actually, it, when you when you're looking to buy a machine, you should actually look more at the company than the machine in a way. Uh, like you would, and 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 listen to other people who've had the experience working with that company as opposed to working with that machine. Yeah. I think I think the way to do it is, like I said, I'm impartial, right? I have this my all my experiences, or the majority of my experiences, SLAs. Yeah, that's what I grew up with. But like I said to you, to me, it's a machine. It's a process. Um, so the processes are all very similar. So if you can use one, you can use the majority of them, and you can learn how to use it very quickly. Um, but, you, you, yeah, I think um, when you're a manufacturer and you're looking into this technology, they have to look at it properly. I've actually been involved when I'm sat there where a sales guy has told the customer a certain thing. And then I come out of the meeting saying, what did you say that for? Because I've actually got to go and tell the guy you can't do that. Mm, yeah, so, yeah. so again, again, it's this, it's this negative. This is the bit we need to get rid of is the negative hype. Yes. Yeah, I think what people, I don't know, I've worked with some really good sales guys as well. You know, I've, I, there are, and um, I, don't, I don't want to come across as being negative towards sales people, but it's actually, you know, when they've got targets uh, you know, I'd ra I would rather sell someone the correct machine than actually make my sort of commission on selling them a wrong machine. And I, the reason I do that is because I, I see when I look at people using this technology, they can, they're not gonna, it ain't going to be the, the only machine they buy. And when they learn more about it, if you educate them properly and you sort of treat them properly, they're going to come back to you. So, so then how do you, how do you as like a customer, like as a manufacturer rather, going into something like Form Next, how do you separate the two? Um, um, I think, you know, talking to people that um, on like all the social media stuff um, about all the different technologies, people that have used all the technologies, you know, I, I have groups where I'm trying to help people that use the sort of, the sort of hobbyist or home machines 
and then you'll get someone that's affiliate. They're not affiliated to it, but they've always used the same machine, and they just constantly buy the same machine. And yes, you know, yeah. it's, it's, to me, all the machines, any three D printer is amazing. See, right, well, I think it's that gap you talk about, though, right, between the the hobbyist and the industrial use case. Like, if I go and search up for a guide on, like, you know, whether Bamboo Labs is a good printer or not, I'll find heaps out there. But if I look up, like, for reviews on the EOS P three nine six, there's not quite the not quite the same availability of data. <laughs> no, I think you know that's one of the good things about AMUG. You know, right. the users of the of the industrial equipment. Um, are there um so that's a good place to go but then then you've got this side where to actually go there you're supposed to own an industrial 3d printer uh yeah yeah uh, yeah, yeah but then I, like, I think like we discussed this the other week you know so but then you just say well actually how do you class what an industrial 3d printer is yeah. I've, I've, I've got a desktop printer at home that you know people have seen the story about the horse that i did mm-hmm. That thing was done on on a desktop 3D printer. So that then, to me, that becomes an industrial 3D printer because I've done an industrial application that actually works. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting you should say that because my takeaway from from Formnext was that it it felt like the industrial machine manufacturers are moving to larger build volumes because they recognize that the, even the, the prosumer machines now are actually getting good enough that they can sort of put up a, they can put up competition for a lot of the use cases where you might be able to fill a composite, like, a, like an advanced polymer instead of metal or something. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, like I said to you earlier, um, it's materials. Materials are going to change this industry. Yeah. You know, I've got industrial machines. I bought myself... Uh, a small Elegoo printer because I wanted to see how good it was. So um, I bought this thing, which was like, what, about 400, 450 pounds, I think. Mm. It was a 8K small machine. When I ended up setting it up in my wife's kitchen, which didn't go down very well when she came home and she couldn't get into a kitchen. <laughs> Can I move this? No, it's building something. Leave it. <laughs> So, but then I saw this part that came off and how long it took, and I'm like, okay, that's damn impressive. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then the good thing about it is, like I said, the amount of different materials I can get. I've actually pr- printed a part, which I'm, it's a tool, it's a material uh, that comes off the machine at 160 degrees. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, sorry, not out. It comes off the machine and it can actually, be, it can actually withstand 160 degrees. It's 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 crazy. It's it's yeah, um... and, and and I haven't got to buy a big vat full. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just use it. And and interestingly, what I've done is I actually got in touch again because I always want to know how things work. You know, when I bought this machine, it was like I wanted to know how much. So I asked Elegoo, how much, how many milliwatts does that screen output? And they'd never been asked. They didn't know. Yeah, and it's because, you know, milliwatts, you're normally measuring in a laser beam. And I found out by working with resin manufacturers that to actually cure their resin, you need something like between four, I think it was four and six milliwatts per square centimeter. Right. And if you get one that does that, then you can use the high-end resins in it. Mm. Right? I've actually put resins in my machine where the resin was twice as much as what the machine cost me, but it works. <laughs> Jeez. And it's it's actually doing that. And then the other thing I've done as well, which again, this is I suppose this is part of my passion for the industry and inquisitory of like doing stuff. I took the material that goes into an Elegoo machine and stuck it in a petri dish and slammed it in an SLA machine with a laser beam, which works on a totally different frequency, and it works. It cured. Wow. Yeah. So I got, four, I got a four hundred five nanometer resin curing with a three fifty five laser. Okay. You know it's supposed to cure. Point one of a millimeter layer, and this thing was about two mil thick. Okay, yeah. Yes, yeah, but it cured. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah. Which means if you play with the parameters, I don't. You know, you'd have. To, I think you'd have to have a hell of a fast laser beam or scanning system, but it would work. But and that opens up a new sort of sort of collection of materials you can stick on these machines. Well, on that on that note, actually, 
so so we spoke a bit about the machines um what about the what about the materials right because there's the there's the experimental side of it and then there's the like who do i rely on for you know for, for going into a production use case again what i tend to look at it depends what i'm doing if i'm building something that is just going to be i don't know a replica for a vehicle or something uh, and it's just like an ornament that sits on the front of a car then i'll just use a standard material you know, and it's really interesting doing stuff and post. I posted things about this particular product or, you know, people on groups are saying, well, I've used this resin, but uh, it's going to become brittle and uh, over time and stuff like that. And I, and I just say to them, and again, to me, this is just common sense. And I suppose it's spending so much in the industry. I just said, here, go and get this kind of UV uh, UV. Uh, resin basically it's it has a uv thing in in a car car lacquer stops sunlight turning or bleaching car paint ah okay yeah and you can actually go into a car man if a car garage it's a paint supplier and you know, they'll give you you can you pay a little bit more for it but you can give you a high high uv resistant clear lacquer ah okay right, right? Yeah, which, yeah. which which also is uh resistant to fuel and oil Right, so I can I use <laughs> I can use a cheap a cheaper resin for this particular component that sits on the front of a vehicle, uh, and then people are worried that it's going to get brittle. Like, you stick UV this UV lacquer on, and it won't because the the actual light can't do anything else to the resin. But there's no risk of like the you know if you use a certain type of resin, for example, like maybe the lacquer won't properly bond with it or something like that. No, in the end, you know, it, well, again. It, if you again this this comes from the model making side of things you, you know give it if, a try and see how it goes no you you're you're aware that you know so so have you ever tried have you ever tried painting a car bumper uh, or for, or for, or for, if any americans are listening for a car fender there you go <laughs> so basically if you've got a plastic fender they're made from i think it's um is it p u and then the paints won't stick to them so you get a special primer Yes. Now I've, yes. I've put on primer before onto a onto my motorcycle pannier. Um, yeah. But, but does it yeah. come off? Does it, does it come off over time? No, no, it yeah. doesn't. Right. So that's again, if you use the right primer. So there's everybody thinks there's a primer paint, then that's it. There's one now. Nah, there's loads. So if you're painting aluminium, you can get a thing called etch primer. Huh. Right. And yeah. what happens with that is it's got like a bit of an it's got acid. So you got to be careful. You got to wear the right protective equipment and everything. You spray that on, what it does, it etches into the surface of the aluminium. Wow. So it okay. keys, to, keys to that surface. And then when you put the paint on the top, it ain't coming off. Right? Yeah, so that's yeah. one thing. With, car, with the car bumpers, it's the same. You can buy a plastic primer, and it's designed to key to that particular type of plastic. That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, and, but that's the stuff I learned from guys that were 60 when I was 23. You know, so... The, the impression I get from this is that a lot for, for you, a lot of the way that you work in additive um, is that you basically um, try and bundle up the experimentation at the beginning and try stuff, just try things, see see how it works, uh, test your results. And then once you've got a process that's reproducible, then push it into something like, you know, then start looking for your industrial machine. Then start. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's the way I, I do it. And I think, a lot of companies need to do that. You know, when I first got the machines into Formula One, what we did is I just basically went in there and they gave me sort of 10 components that they manufactured and how they manufactured it, how long it used to take. And then it was my job to actually, can we do this using additive manufacturing? And it wasn't necessarily always uh, 3D printing. Some of it was vacuum casting. So I think, have you heard of vacuum casting? Of course, I've done vacuum yeah, casting. Yeah, yeah. All right. So basically, you make the prototype, don't you? And so you know, it was a combination of everything. But I think the only the reason that I was able to do all that is because I've done it all. Mm. It's not just it's not just hearing about it and reading about it. It's actually you've done it, so you you understand it more. You know, mm. some of the advice I give to people. I've walked into a company not so long ago, actually, and they were making the vacuum casting boxes to pour the silicon into. Right. And the guy's trying to find bits of wood. He's taking old bits that he's still got silicon on it, stripping it down the time he's taking. And I just looked at him, I said, go and buy yourself a box of Lego. And he went, what? I said, go and buy some Lego. 
I said, you can make the boxes out of Lego. I said, and also look at the shape of that. That's an L shape. You're not going to make an L shaped box to put your silicon into because it takes too much time. So you, you make a square box as small as you can so you're not wasting material. I said, with Lego, you can make the box any shape you want. And then when it's finished, you just pull it away, stick it back in a box, and it's ready to make the next box. Yeah, yeah. And it, and again, it was it was one of that. And I, I still find I find it funny because the guy, when they, you know, he's talking to an older bloke, and he's like, Lego. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then it, when I but when I explain it to him, it's it's it's, it's dead simple, hmm. you know. And you don't use the cheap Lego. You don't use the Lego copies either because they don't fit together properly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So then what happens? Your silicon leaks through the gaps and stuff. So you've got to make sure you use the right stuff. It's it an interesting like promotion for Lego. Really well. <laughs> I'm just yeah. going to keep some detergent nearby so you can clean them off when they're, when they're inevitably. Well, I'm lucky, I suppose. You know, I ran a machine at a university for two years. Uh, it was to let SMEs use a piece of kit that they couldn't afford. But then it was also to teach the students to actually. Yeah, you know, they could use it for their projects. And I was luckily I was luckily to work with uh Dr. Chris Sutcliffe, who's really well known within this industry now. Yeah. He was doing his PhD when I was at the same university. So working with people like that, I actually I went there. The first thing I did when I got involved with this was uh, Liverpool University were well known for lasers. And I'm like, as far as I'm concerned, the only thing a laser does is cut James or tries to cut James Bond up. <laughs> yeah, so I actually thought I'll go and sit in one of these lectures uh, about lasers, and then I learned that you know you can actually clean veins out with a laser beam. Yeah, and then you yeah you see stuff and you just think, wow. It, yeah, so then isn't I, it amazing as well when you when you like when you make a connection from something? It's like totally different industry, and then you're like, yeah. oh, I've. I've solved the abstraction of this problem before, or yeah. or you're introducing something to me that solves another abstraction for a, a different problem that I have. Yeah, it always happens. So there's times I, always, I go into schools and I teach kids, and it's something I always tell people, you know, you never fail. Yeah. It's it's just learning. Yeah. Uh, the, only t the only time that I say to these children, the only time that you fail is when you quit. Mm. Yeah. So what you do is this thing. I've had things where, you know, I've actually put the E C and D P value wrong in a in an SLA machine. And then the part came out like it looked like a I don't know, a, like a soft, chewy sweet. But then there's times I've actually thought, man, I could have done with that because you know, that could have helped me do something else. And like I remember doing vacuum castings where we needed a live hinge. Yeah, and to get the live hints to work is, you know, it's not that easy. So all I used to do, what I used to do is get pieces of live hinge, insert them into the, make it so that I inserted them into the tool, and when you did just you did your vacuum casting over the top, it had real live hinges in it that wouldn't break. Oh wow! Yeah, and that's then you cool. put a dovetail, in, and then you put a dovetail in so it fitted in properly and actually held in properly. So that's kind of, that's like combining my woodwork side of things. Yeah into yeah. a, a manufacturing process to get the best result where the customer, you know, we, we manage, you know, the, you got to remember when I first started, I think there were three resins. Yeah, right? of course. And then, so you've got to yeah, be very resourceful in how, you, uh, in how you tackle problems. Yeah, and then what I found, so one company wanted to make live hinges, and I said, well, how many times does it have to open and close? He said, it's just for a meeting. If it fails after the meeting, um, you know, it'll be fine. And I actually realized that if you left an epoxy resin in acetone for probably about 10 or 15 minutes, the part would go soft, right? And it would be fine. You just give it to them, you know, uh, basically put it in, let it, let it go, and then you let it all evaporate. It goes to the meeting, they can handle it, it opens and closes. But after about an hour, it becomes totally brittle, and as soon as you bend it once, it it's gone. Ah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but again, that again, that was an accident. I left a model in that acetone for too long by accident. Yeah. I realized that it went flexible, and I'm like, oh, that might be useful one day. Experiential. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very experiential. <laughs> yeah, so things happen, and you just think, well, well, well great. I'm pretty I'm sure there was again. a Simpsons episode like... that was on that topic as well. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably, probably. So, um, so yeah, this, this... come on. 
There's one other thing I wanted to just chat to you about, which you alluded to earlier when you were working at the university, right? Which is that you had a machine that you that was there for SMEs, right? So like that's yeah. one of the things that really got me at, at Form Next is that you know for me, for example, I work with a lot of manufacturers who um, who start with consumer machines and then they upgrade, they graduate to, you know, the multi-jet fusion, they graduate to SLS machines, and they they eventually, you know, build out more and more capabilities. And um, I mean, how do, the, these machines are so expensive, like the, you, you're, so you're, you're talking about like a huge allocation of capital when you go out to when you go out to get one of these machines, right? Um, yeah. I mean, would you have any advice for people who are making that making that shift? Um, well, I've done it the other way. I've, this is something we were going to discuss, isn't it? I've yes. gone from using industrial ones to buying the cheaper ones, buying FDM machines, uh, the MSLA machines, because I wanted to, you know, that in the end, I think the the industry's changed massively in the last, let's sort of say, five or six years, and it's it's not down to the big manufacturers. It's actually, it's actually come from the hundreds of thousands of different types of home ones you can get. You know, if you went into a mass production side of things, yes, you'd probably go for a, if you could afford it, you'd go, go for one of the really expensive ones then because I think the biggest difference is you've got more, I suppose it's more control over the process in the bigger machines. You know, they've, they've been around for a longer time. Um, uh, but it doesn't. It still doesn't mean there's that it's still the best. You know, I met a couple of guys at TCT. It was interesting. They were they were from um, I think Arizona, Arizona, right? Great ice right. tea, right? Yeah, I like that. and then they actually, I actually saw them at TCT. So this tiny two young guys, I got this printer that was probably. I would say maybe 600 by 600 by 600, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, and it could print peak. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, right. Now, peak is a really high temperature material. And you've got, you know, it's an extreme material, but the applications for it are fantastic. Yes. Now, normally, to print, normally to print peak, you have to, if you want to do it on an SLS machine, you've got to have a special machine. Yes. Right. Yeah. And then, um, the difference in this thing cost, I think, it was about five thousand dollars. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then also I met another. <laughs> it's interesting. I meet people because of the travels that you do. You meet some interesting people, and I met a guy called Andy Anderson, and he works for a company called Vitrex, and they make peak. Uh, okay, as if just, as if they make by, the material. Yeah, they're they're the biggest manufacturer of machine of peak material. Is it is it filament or is it is it is a powder? It's actually a pellet. Well, it's a plastic. It's normally a pellet form. Pellet form, right? He was basically looking at getting powdered materials into powdered peak into the high end SLS machines. So then okay. I started talking to him, and I said, "Well, you know, how is this like you?" I asked that question. I said, "What form is it at the moment?" And he said, "Well, it's a it's a pellet form." Um, or you know, and I, and I said, well, the biggest problem with peaking an SLS machine is it you can't refresh. There's no refresh rate. If you build a, if you put one part on a big platform, the rest of the material inside that tank is scrap. Yeah, and that's why it's expensive. And I'm like, well, you want? I actually said to him, I said, have you ever thought about running this through an FDM machine? And I said, because that way you're just printing what you need, and you're not you're, you're not go all that waste. And it was interesting. Yeah. So I actually, I asked, and he, and he said to me, "Well, you know, we're not sure whether it'll work." And I just said, "It does." And he said, mm -hmm. "How do you know that?" I says, "Because I've actually had a piece of, uh, well, I said I've got I had a piece of F, of um, filament peak, and I basically just turned, I had a hot end that we could put really high." And I just pushed this thing through by hand and it melted. And I'm like, okay, so it will work. You just got to optimize, you know, it won't, it won't work in a standard, uh, off, you know, one of the smaller machines because it basically needs high temperatures, needs probably more and more needs a, to have it to run properly, needs an enclosure with heated enclosure. 
Yes. But then they but then these two young lads have done it. And then they've got, you know, they've they've actually got um a, it's an aluminium extruded frame. It's just a, a two guys making this thing, playing with it. They put in putting closures on it, doors on it, heaters on it. But it lets them do different things with different materials. And I think that's that's fantastic. Have you ever thought about doing like um like a wiki, like a, a wiki of like the experiments you run and that sort of thing? Because I could imagine something like that would be would be you know. Um, it's be- it's interesting, you know. I'm 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 you got to remember I'm a lot older. I'm probably closer to the end of my career than you are to starting you starting yours. Uh, <laughs> but it's one of those things. I won't retire. There's so much, there's so many things, and when I see things change and I see new materials and I see new technologies, I'm like, I'm automatically sort of already thinking what else I can do with it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I remember, I remember, I don't know how long ago, so 3D, so it was like probably 28, 27, 28 years ago, and they made a wax printer. And I just said to them one day, Have you ever thought of printing chocolate sooner? And it didn't. It was, they found it a bit funny. But then, eighteen years, eighteen years later, the chocolate, the first chocolate printer was came out, and I'm like, yeah. well, eighteen years were behind. Would you believe you know, one so of my manufacturers it, it, is uh, working on board, uh, working on a chocolate printer right now? Right, then we we need to talk to because I'm actually working with a guy up in the Lake District. Uh, um, is he's, he's actually called the the blind chocolatier. Blind. Oh, this so, is like um, this is this, this is like something from Lord of the Rings. Like uh, this man in the Lake District called the Blind. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, so he's actually got you know he he, he makes these amazing chocolates. His skills are crazy, and he's interested in using three D printing. But then there's conflicts of how you do things because he has these like glass finishes to his chocolates, which you're never ever going to get from a three D printer. Yeah, but in the in the end, this guy, like I said, if he wants to go down, and this is this is the same piece of advice I can give to anybody really. This particular industry is he wants to have these glass finishes, you know, and it, and he puts the colours on and all. So they're absolute. They're, they're a work of art. You don't want to eat them. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case he's looking at and think, man, how did you do that? And then you think, if I bite it, I'm going to ruin it. But then that's what they're for, for eating. And this can go out of anything. It doesn't have to be a chocolate. If you're going to make a product and you want it to be 3D printed, you have to emphasize and use the layers as a positive thing. Mm. So instead of trying to hide them, yeah, you need to make it a feature. Yeah. Right? Same, it doesn't matter whether you're making chocolates, you're making, I don't know, a pen giveaways whatever design again and this is where this df what is it design for DF, DF, yeah. Yeah. design for additive I, manufacturing <laughs> and I, I i think i told you the other week i was on a call with a group of people and i'm like i actually don't know what that means but then for me as a designer i actually learned uh, it's it's a bit sad really I, I when i'm building something i think like the machine I actually mm-hmm. think about how that machine is going to build that part, and that, and that helps me orientate the part better. I know where this, I actually know where the supports are going to go before the software does it. Yeah, and I and I know so so it's a bit so for me, I suppose the was design for additive manufacturing is is it's inbuilt into me as a designer because I've grown up over the last thirty years, but I do it automatically. Do you, uh, have you ever programmed like like written code? Do you write much code? Um, I've I, I, I've ne- I've never done it. To be honest, the only thing, the only sort of code we used to write was sort of when you were loading files into the original three D printer. It was DOS, so you had to type all the commands in. A lot of programmers talk to themselves, me included. I really talk to myself when I'm coding. Like I I I'll have like a a whole conversation with myself. Like that this this world that you're in, and you can see all the connections, but it's. You have to. I think ver- anybody verbalizing it somehow makes it real. I think that happens with anybody that's got a passion for anything. Yeah. You know, if you watch, say, you watch an F one driver, right, and he'll be sat in his car, and you'll see them. They'll have their eyes closed, and they'll, and then you'll actually see them moving their head round, and they're actually 
envisaging, especially during qualifying, right, before they get back in the car, and you'll see them. Yeah. And they're basically, they're doing exactly the same about, and they're actually going, I'm good, that's that corner, that's that corner. And I think anybody that's got a passion for it, that's a way of, yeah, it's like double checking that you're doing things right as well. I, I'm, my wife always says to me, what the heck are you doing talking to that machine? And I'm like, well, that's, it, it, I'm just, you, you're basically talking to yourself about what you're going to do and how that material is going to come out of that machine or how that laser is going to affect that particular resin in that certain place and geometry. So, you, again, it's, it's as, after, and I, again, I've never discussed this side of things before until you just mentioned that. And it's, you realize I'm not the only, thank God I'm not the only one that does it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the diversity thing is important to me, and it isn't diversity just based on um, gender. Yeah. It's everything. You know, I'm, I'm an artist that went into 3D printing, and I've, I, I've, I've had people say to me, how's an artist going to help us in our engineering project? And I said, because it's, I don't think like you. And it's really positive to see um, big companies now. I was at a conference the other week where Siemens, they've actually got a, a protocol in place now to actually employ uh, neurodiverse people, you know, Absolutely, because in the end, the more people with different thoughts you have involved in developing something, the more advanced you're going to make it. Yes. Uh, so that's critical. Um, I think we need to get to a point where we start where, where we're sharing more and more stuff um, about this technology. Uh, for younger people that have got involved in it, look back at what we've done in the past, learn from it, and don't. You know, I've found a lot of people are going over some things that we've done before and they should be talking to us and saying, hey, have you done this before? Yeah, this is how we did it. And then they use that as their starting point rather than going over what we've already done. Um, and it is, I think it's the community of sharing stuff and, you know, um, yeah. So um, openness, really, openness and um, and uh, sharing information, sh sharing information and then also indexing that information so people could find it. And also yep. when you're starting a project, making sure to, to go and check as well. Yeah, do it all before you. Yeah, before you're actually going to go and talk to any, anybody that's any of the machine manufacturers, make sure you're going to talk to the right people. Make sure you, you know, you know what you want to make it out of. Like I said, if you think, actually, we've got to make this out of metal, have you actually checked it if there isn't a plastic there that's, hmm. that's a, that can actually do it? Because you look at some of these plastics now, like peak can withstand massive temperatures. You know, you can stick that on the top of an engine and run it under the bonnet. Yeah. Yeah? And that's, uh, and that's another one. One last note, recycling materials, we need to sort that out. Hmm. Yeah, resins. Recycle resins, grind the parts up, use it as the next filler in the next version of a filled resin. It might not be as good as the last one, but it might be good enough to do a certain application. So, um, yeah, I think that's another thing we've got to look at. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't affect me as much because I'm not going to be I'm not going to be around as long as you guys. But you know, that's why I'm bothered about it is the fact that we need to do it for you, next generation after that. Um. And let's see where we go. It's like PLA. People say it's biodegradable. Yeah. I, when somebody said it's biodegradable to me, it's like in two weeks, if I stick it in a compost, it's gone. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, even yeah. PLA, Biodegradable. Yeah, it, 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 it isn't. On what time scale? Yeah. Yeah. So we need to know, we need to know everything. We need to try and get the manufacturers to be more open with stuff like that. Um, um, because otherwise it's a, we're just wasting our time. So, but great to talk to you. I, I could talk to you for hours, mate. There's there's yeah. loads of stuff that we there's loads of stuff we haven't discussed. You know, it's like my background. People, you know, people don't know what. You know, I come from an artist, but there's loads of stuff.